Okay, good morning everyone, our distinguished uh, participants. Good to see all of you today and on behalf of Climate Governance Malaysia, I would like to warmly welcome you to the Climate Chair Masterclass Series. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming out time from your very busy schedule for the Masterclass. I know all of us here, our calendars are full, so I'm really, really grateful that you're here. Um, it is our belief that you know the ROI for uh, for the time spent, for the time invested on building up uh, our climate knowledge. You know whether as a board member, whether you're a chair of a board or chair of a committee, that ROI is going to be hugely significant, and we really believe that it's going to make a big difference. So I'm really grateful that all of you uh, make time today. Um, I also want to thank uh, our sponsors who made all of this possible for us. You know, we uh, specifically I want to thank uh, the Securities Commission, you know, who opened up the facility for us today, and they were very gracious hosts. But I also want to call out that we had the good support of Bursa, uh, as well as Fide Forum, um, ICDM, and also IOI Properties, and all of them have been extremely supportive. Uh, the Climate Chair Masterclass series, uh, some of you may be aware, it's a series of seven masterclass in total, all on very different topics. Yeah, and um, we're very excited. It's, it's curated uh, specifically for, uh, for where, where we are today. To, and today itself, we're going to be focusing on the concept of double materiality. And we are extremely lucky to have with us Ms. Uh, Pang Oi Cheng right? <laughs> from KPMG to, to lead the masterclass for us. Um, we did our first session about a month ago and that was on scaling up the circular economy. It was really a very productive session. So the, uh, the series itself goes all the way until December. Uh, so the agenda today is pretty straightforward. What we want to do is we want to make sure that watching gets maximum time, you know, so it's back to school. So back to school, back to the class for us. You know, she's going to bring us through uh, the, uh, the, the class right up till about noon time. So um, to kick us off, I want to ask uh, Datin Sunita to come forward. You know, she is the chair of Climate Governance Malaysia. Um, she has been uh, the main force behind this uh, Climate Chair Masterclass series. So, Dr. Sunita, thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Thank you so much for coming out. I want to keep this short as well because we're all here to listen to Pang Hoi Ching. Um, I want to remind us, yesterday was Earth Overshoot Day. And Malaysia being a net exporting nation, our overshoot day was on the 16th of May. So we recognize that we're extracting far more from the environment than the environment can replenish. And there are consequences for this. Uh, and this is, this is why ESG sustainability has become front and center on this radar. We've now, the United Nations Secretary General now says that we've gone past the era of global warming. We are now in the era of global boiling. And we've already seen this in this part of the world where we had extreme heat wave in the region in May where there were a number of deaths and uh, records being broken. And this was before El Nino. So it's just going to get far, far worse. And this all comes back to the board of directors. The climate emergency has been so mainstream, it will be impossible for you to claim that you didn't understand, you didn't know. So these are the, this is the responsibility of long-term stewards of the organization. Not just to manage these risks and mitigate and adapt, but also the opportunities that are arising from this existential crisis. So I want to remind us that disclosure, which is what we're also going to be talking about, is a double-edged sword. Remember that whatever you're disclosing, and you might think this looks great, we've got a very clear transition pathway to net zero or halving our footprint, but it's a double-edged sword because all your competitors are doing the same thing, and the reader of the accounts is also the allocator of capital, and they are going to decide if more capital should be allocated to you, whether an investor or a banker, 
or if it's patently clear that you don't understand the enormity of the crisis and therefore capital needs to be diverted away from you. Finally, a very quick shout out, we've got a very big summit coming up, 5th to 7th September at Sasana Kijang. So please keep the dates free, the program will be unveiled in the next newsletter that's coming out next week. Thank you so much for coming everyone. Thank you. Um, so, um, I'm going to be, uh, before I call Boi Cheng up, I want to do a quick introduction. Uh, so Boi Cheng will be familiar to some of you. Um, she currently leads uh, KPMG's ESG and Sustainability Advisory Services here in Malaysia. Um, she is indeed the right person to bring us through this topic. Uh, she has over 30 years of experience in the sustainability space. And she's indeed very experienced in developing and improving ESG sustainability, uh, sustainability management programs of public listed companies to meet the requirements of international investors and benchmarks. And this will be the likes of GRI, FTSE for Good, TCFD, CDP guidelines, and so on and so forth. Um, she's also very knowledgeable in the area of carbon accounting, you know, based on the greenhouse gas protocol. And over the years, you know, she has done a number of this type of uh, training, right, uh, to all levels of the organization. And uh, her expertise covers uh, sustainability reporting, sustainability performance improvement, life cycle assessment, and also ESG uh, auditing, among others. She has, uh, her experience is not limited to Malaysia, you know, so she is extremely well known across Asia Pacific. Um, and indeed today, you know, this topic itself, one and a half hours, perhaps not enough, <laughs> but I will pass the floor to you. Uh, and um, I, I think you will be asking for uh, uh, active participation from the audience as well. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. So much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I'm testing whether this microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I think my Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to be speaking among um, directors of experience. And by and much, my assumption is you guys will have attended training on the NG already. You guys will know what it means with regards to what I usually do the roles and responsibilities. So I'm not going to go around. I'm going to stick very much to what is double materiality, what does it mean? And for those of you who attended my, my training previously, and I see some of you here, uh, you will know I like to keep this very interactive. So in between, anywhere, if you feel that you've got questions to ask, please ask. There's no such thing as a stupid question, but I always tell people, you need the law means you need the law. So ask, and feel free to interrupt me, I'm fine with that as well, and it keeps, um, and, and well, how do you say, keep pushing the boundary of knowledge, basically. I'm not here to lecture, I'm here to discord, I'm here to discuss. Right, so what is double materiality? Sorry. <laughs> what is double materiality? Most of you would have heard of materiality, right? What do you think materiality is? Sustainability report or when your team does the sustainability report and they report to you is 
what is my impact to the environment, and what my impact to the local community, what do I need to think about? But when you think about doing strategic development, strategy <coughs> for your organization is, what are the prevailing factors there that will impact the way I do business? Correct? It's an outside in view. So what are the things that will impact me? What is the market saying about my product? Where do you think I can go in selling my product? It's an outside in view with financial implications, correct? So it's basically asking how and where is the best area that you can sell your product in the best condition that you have. What are the obstacles and all? So the outside in view is basically now asking you to consider the all these emerging factors, you know, all these emerging high risk areas or new opportunity areas that could impact you from a financial material perspective on the ESG front. But actually now, when we talk about business, we're not talking about separating business initiative and then ESG initiative. We're not talking about how ESG, climate change specifically, impact with regards to your business strategy. So think about it. Let's say, for example, you have a product. It's made uh, in Malaysia. The raw materials come from China, right? And uh, it has to come to your uh, to the Malaysia to be assembled by boat upstream. Then after it's assembled, it is exported. Once it's exported, it goes to a third party country. So when and it's exported generally, unless you're talking about electronic, and by and large, it's by also by ship, correct? So, what are the risks that then comes with regards to your the, the saleability of your product? If you sell to Europe, there's a whole slew of legislation coming up that's going to impact the saleability of your product, the reputation of your company. If you sell by ship, by raw material, by ship at all, you are going to be impacted by climate change. You are going to be experiencing a lot of, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, storms and all, increasingly now, over the last five years, if I look at the newspaper, every every now and then I see oh this big container is hit by by, by storm, lost container, don't know how many containers lost, twenty five containers lost, this how much containers lost. There is a financial impact, correct? And so if your raw material, presumably by the time it sent to you, would have paid for, there's a commitment for payment, there's a financial exposure there. When you send your finished product off to wherever country there is, and even see by stock, there's a financial exposure there. Correct? On top of that, everybody remembers what happened to our uh, 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 glove manufacturers who are trying to sell to the US, right? Social aspects comes in and bring financial impact. We're working with clients who have been impacted with the WRO not lifted. They are still suffering the financial impact. So that's what we mean. By looking at the financial impact with regards to sustainability issues. Very often we are very used to looking at what how do I impact, but we we in a way look at it from a strategic point of view. But over the last few years, I would say for a lot of board members, a lot of companies, we have started increasingly infusing sustainability considerations in. But where we are, I will take it now from the very beginning, where we are weak at is tying the financial consideration to financial uh, to in, in terms of impact reporting. Generally, if you think about the annual reports you've been involved in, if you think about the financial reports, the financial statements that you've been involved in, in terms of the sustainability report that you've been involved in, or even the integrated report that you've been involved in, how many times have we as board members say, cannot, 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 we cannot report this? Telling the world how good we are or proprietary secrets and all. Remember? If you haven't very good, I have met board members that basically we cannot report this, cannot tell our our our, our competitors what we are doing and all. Right? And so it's a disadvantage because the requirement for double materiality comes from international standard requirements such as the CCMP. And now the ISSB, I'm preempting all my slides, by the way. <laughs> and it's tailored for investors. If it's tailored for investors, won't your bankers be asking for it? Won't your customers be asking for it? Won't your customer, before they sign a long-term contract deal with you for you to supply X number of gadgets to them, say, 
Yes, you'll get a copy of this. Internal shareholders, internal to employees and all, always saying, what will impact my business? Where can I find new business? What do I need to do to develop new business? But they don't consider multiple stakeholders. And multiple stakeholders sometimes means you have to go beyond your borders. If your customer, if your customer's customer is the end point there, Given the fact that the EU has come up with so many regulations on it, wouldn't it be a good idea to talk to your customer's customer as part of your stakeholder engagement, right? Because they are your ultimate customer in the end. And if you, if um, quite over the years also, quite a lot of companies actually tell me, cannot sell to Europe and US, never mind now, I sell to China. <laughs> Correct? Right? Sell to China can, but you know China has one of the most advanced environmental laws there are. Right? So, you also need to understand the outside environment and how it impacts you with regards to your product, kan? Right? So, in that, in, in that perspective, we are good at looking at the internal aspect. We are not so good at looking at this. And if you are not so good at looking at this, and then tie it to financial materiality, kan? There, there is a breakdown. There is a gap in the way that we approach materiality assessment. Right? So then we have to consider in terms of the duration of what you want to do, what is the positive and negative impact, what are your risk level and your risk appetite, and your metrics and targets. So for us at KPMG, we have been doing this, or rather we have been trying to get our clients to do this <laughs> for a long, long time. Unfortunately, where we find resistance and that's where boards actually need to set up and take note because Board got fiduciary, fiduciary duty kan? We're sitting in the SC kan? <laughs> Screen has also reported already kan? For climate, there is board fiduciary exposure, correct? Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of this screen statement, who hasn't heard of this screen statement? Everybody has. Okay, very good. You have to be aware of what this risk are. So now, what's happening in, in, in terms of the greater space? Uh, you know, in, in terms of looking, once you understand what your material assessment is, what your financial risk is, what your, uh, how you integrate it into your risk, and then how you incorporate it in your strategy, and from your strategy, you can, then can determine what the financial impacts are. Because you can't manage all the ESG. When you do materiality assessment, you could come up with thousands. You could come up with a few hundred at least. I guarantee you, most companies come up with, with about 150 to 300 risk uh, and, uh, material matters. You can't manage them, so you have to prioritize them as you go through in terms of the materiality matrix, which is the normal risk assessment process, and then you identify what is high important. So you probably end up manageable in six or five or six uh, in, in terms of manage manageability. But don't forget that by the time it goes into the enterprise risk assessment, you're talking about integrated risk already. You're not talking about, and no company at this day and age has moved forward with all the new reporting uh, 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 pressures that are on at this present moment. 
I wouldn't say the requirements, I would say the pressures that are on at this moment. You shouldn't be talking about, oh, my risk enterprise says this, my risk is this, my material matter says this. You shouldn't. You should be talking about one integrated risk assessment. <coughs> Right? And, and if companies are still coming to you saying that, oh, my material matters are this and my, sustain, uh, my enterprise risk is this, it's a good time to ask them to please start thinking about integrations. How you want to integrate. Because it's impossible to manage two types of risk. And sometimes I read sustainability reports. You guys might not be aware you, because you look at the report in a discreet manner. I look at many, many reports. And what I see sometimes the company seems to be Schizophrenic. Sustainability report says this, annual report says this, and sometimes they don't jive. Schizophrenic. And so you wonder in terms of controls that you have to deal with. And all of this are responsibility of the board. Right? It, it, it is not to do with, it is not to do with uh, uh, sustainability, sustainability, we pedal our own canoe this way. Sustainability now is an integral part of business. Sustainability measure matters now are primarily, primarily driven by climate risk. Because from climate risk, you get environmental risk, you get social risk, and you got governance risk. So how do you then package it all together so that you get a broad overview as members of the board? And I'm speaking from board perspective. Huh? I'm not speaking as, offer, uh, as the doers of coming up with this programs at all for, for you to evaluate. How do you then gain a big picture with regards to double the challenge? Most of you get sustainability report uh, statements, I mean uh, assessments provided to you, correct? How many of you get them reported to you as an integrated risk perspective from the board risk or, or main board? How many of you? Two? No? 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 Is it integrated or not integrated? integrated? Not integrated. So it's time that you move them along to Because you cannot look at sustainability risk this one month, and then suddenly they give you business risk another month, and by that time you one month to the other month. So there is no connectivity. And that's what we see. So as members of the board, you should ask this question. When are you planning to integrate uh, materiality assessment from sustainability into your enterprise risk assessment process. Second question you should ask is, what is your risk appetite? What is our risk appetite with regards to climate risk and human rights risk? Two main risks in terms of ESG. You want to talk about the whole ESG, everybody says need to do this, line, need to do that. In Malaysia, we only have two big problems. Climate change, because we have no laws and regulations, but we have the National uh, Renewable Energy Transition Roadmap, right? That's released. And the second one is human rights, although that has gone very quiet. But we are still within the, the purview of human rights because the EU has just released new legislation called uh, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, CSDD, which focuses on human rights, by the way. So what does that mean? If your company exports, if your company exports any intermediary that goes eventually to Europe, you will get as part of their supply chain auditors. We are already seeing an uptick of audit uh, 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 activities in Malaysia on the supply chain, on human rights, but nobody is talking about it. Will it have a material impact on your business? Are we factoring it on your business into our business? Yes, for some companies. Most companies, I can tell you, no. Right? So these these are things that are important. And what goes into your uh, business strategy is even more important because this is your forward plan then. Right? Your forward plan for the next three years or five years or one year. I, I don't think most companies go on one year strategy, three year strategy or five years strategy, where you want to go. How much money you want to make? How much money you want to spend? What are your financial liabilities, exposures that you could have, which should be included in your strategy? Okay, in terms of, as I always tell my clients, there's two levels of reporting. Internal granular reporting for management and the board, and external reporting, which is not so granular, to the public. If you don't know your full exposure, when you as members of the board 
get the, the exposure report, right? My strategy wants to do this. And if you're more focused on PNL, there's nothing wrong with it. Go for your You must save money to be sustainable. If you are not sustainable as a business, then no point talking PNG, right? So you must make money as, as a business, but these are things that impact the way you do business. Right? It's not impacting your business, but it's impacting the way you do business. So let's say, for example, you're working with, with a client who has a site in Poplet. It's also got a site in Denkil. Risk map shows that if it floods, if temperature, uh, sorry, if global uh, sea level rises to one meter, his flat site will flood. So if you speak to him now, you know, are you suffering impact to flood? Yes, we are, but at least minimal when it comes to my <laughs> So no disruption to business. But eventually, they say the, the sustainability team says uh, oh, the, the sea level is actually rising in terms of flood. So what do you do? Are you going to end up with a stranded asset in future? Because eventually you cannot do business. Or you make plans to move. What would be the sensible thing to do? Make plans to move. Huh? Don't have to move now. Make plans to move, right? I spent three hours of arguing the CFO. Why is this to be learned? You also have mitigation factors. Yeah, that's why he said, right? But OK, you can put sand back to prevent water coming in, can short term. If can cut, right? No, no, short term. Short term can. But eventually, you can say, I raised a foundation, I raised my wall, whatever. OK, your, your, your site is impenetrable to water. Your, your, your vehicles cannot come in. Your raw materials cannot come in. Your workers cannot go out. Your workers cannot come in. How? Huh? You're still isolated. Oh, situations where just the policy comes in, the adaptation. Yes. So you can say the whole of crime or the whole if the government has that study in place, they should be working on the adaptation. Then they complement with the respective companies uh, uh, mitigation. The that adaptation is equally important. Correct, correct. But but the thing is is that like like I, you know, that's what you know. I've been telling actually all my clients this time. Like, Narim came up with a report. Narim is the National Hydraulic Institute of Malaysia. Came up with a report on uh, climate risk for Malaysia. For the whole of Malaysia, 2015, 2016, 2017. They work with international universities. They came up with a report. At one time, they were selling the report. Up to now, I just spoke to Bank Negara recently. Even Bank Negara did not buy the report. Don't ask me. Why? I cannot answer that. Right? So how? Maybe it's under review again. Maybe it's been updated again. I don't know. We don't know. We need that data. This is hearsay. When you be in this practice, apparently years ago there was already such a report. Correct. Somehow it was held back. But Correct. Apparently if this poor thing to over, it would panic a lot businesses and put a lot of money into this. So if you run a mortgage portfolio in a bank, for example, then then you wake up with financing and get it and open it for other things. So the risk profile will change. Yes, but so apparently they are keeping it under yeah, that. I, so I they don't want to manage that this because they don't have it. Let, let's put it this way. Bank the gara is because they must admit where the issues are. They don't even talk about managing yeah. this. Bank the gara has required financial institutions to start looking at their climate. As part of this climate risk evaluation, banks now and insurance companies now have to evaluate where the high risk portfolios are, the location of the high risk portfolios. Without this information, they can't do that. Without that assessment, bank and government cannot know what is the financial impact that could hit our economy in the event that we have 10 times December 2021. That is the impact of December 2021, 10 times more. That is something that Bank Nagara is trying to evaluate. We need to be able to evaluate where our financial exposures are. We need to know where our financial impact are so that for insurance companies, you can make uh, allocations and budgets. For banks, the same thing. So we, we actually did that with this is also additional resources. But if you don't tell the banks, at least are aware of it, insurance are aware of it, business are not aware of it, they three quarters of the time they ask me, why do I have to move? So for all the companies that you're sitting in, if they are in multi-site, multi-state, 
and they have been impacted by flood. The evaluation of risk and financial impact needs to be done. It's a pure self-protection mechanism. We're not even talking about reporting yet. Right? We're not even talking about reporting yet. But if you don't tell, as we are now, uh, board of directors of this risk, how are you able to understand what your risk exposures are? And that's the purpose of doing double materiality. Because your investors are asking you, how are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And what have you measures have you put in place to uh, to 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 uh, uh, how do you say protect yourself? So we've got companies like Shanghai Korean Bank reporting with regards to financial impact like this. Like I said earlier, a lot of the companies in the world, I'm not talking about Asia, are not ready to report from a financial impact per se. So they dance around the topic. And they dance around the topic like this. They give you tick, 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 dog, 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 dog. So what will happen eventually if you report like this without the financial information backing up, your investor is going to rock up to you and say, hey, you reported this in your integrated report or your annual report. Please come show me what your financial impact is. I am considering the position of my investment in you. That will happen. And that's already happened for some of our clients. Right? So, you have to be, you have to go beyond the idea that double materiality in TCFD reporting and eventually in ISSB2, IFRSS2 reporting is a reporting function. It is not a reporting function. Reporting is an outcome of the work that you're doing with regards to evaluation of your risk and identification of where your future opportunities are going to be. For you internally as board of directors, you need to be aware what these exposures are eventually. Right? So we've got the Hardware Group, which uh, does uh, supply of electrical uh, products, and the German company is a German company. And remember, under German company, there are other under German reporting requirements. They do tell you uh, exposure wise, bucket wise, where the high financial risk are. But even then, still, they do not report with regards to financial numbers. What are the numbers? What are the financial impact? Many companies are very uncomfortable about reporting this. Right? So you have to be aware. Many ways of reporting, you want to, you want to be cynical with regards to quality of reporting to, that meets the, 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 what is it, the principle of the requirement, you can. But you want to do reporting that basically outlines exactly where you are being a leader or th considering so that you can attract better investor value, you should think about more depth in terms of your reporting. So this is one example, I, I apologize, this is, this is more even for me, but you will get the slide. One example is Reliance, everybody heard of Reliance, right? Indian company, one of the leaders in terms of integrated reporting, so they report the financial capital in terms of uh, what goes into the organization, and this is integrated reporting perspective from, from what goes in in terms of money and what comes out in terms of financial impact. This is probably one of the clearest way, way in which you report financial impact. Inputs and output. And we work with quite a number of companies also doing integrated report. Unfortunately, when it comes to, apart from the financial aspect of this, the rest of it, Members of the board, you keep telling us and your sustainability team, oh no, 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 we don't need to be so credulous. If you're not that credible, think of a way that represents the number in the best way possible. But moving forward, you do have to start thinking about financial impact reporting, particularly from a climate change perspective. So let's think about this. Sorry, I'm going to have a seat. Right. Let's think about this. We have got Petronas. The recourse from Petronas here. We got members of Petronas. We got members of TNB. Got? Or other utility companies? Got? No need to raise hand. Got? Got none. Okay. You got financiers or them, right? Okay. Let's say uh, Petronas. As I said earlier. 
has a net zero plan. Net zero plan, uh, they talk a, a lot in terms of their reporting on carbon capture utilization and storage. Carbon capture or CCUS is high investment requirement. It captures the carbon, it stores away the carbon, and is that a, you don't discover the leakages and all of that, discover the, the, the queries with regards to the soundness of the technology. So we recently did an evaluation for CCUS technology for, for a client, and the investment will be in, in, in the region of billions. Without a carbon tax, Malaysia no carbon tax, right? It will be pure sunken cost only. We don't have a successful business model yet to sell the space in our CCUS to other companies. Say, hey, your neighbor, there, come, come, come. You sell to me, I buy, you know. I, I have this service, you buy the space for me, you can put all your carbon in there. Nobody is willing to invest in that yet. So it's a high billion dollar investment. High billion dollar investment to capture carbon with no return. What is the impact on the books? Bankers here. Will you invest? No. So out of curiosity, since it's an open book, have you had a review of the Petronas net zero policy? Uh, sustainable or financeable? Sorry, Dato, I am not at liberty to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right, but if you look at the, the reporting, a lot of the reporting that there has been provided, where are the numbers? That's all I'm saying. How do you evaluate the long-term sustainability for the climate goals? Are there plenty? Net zero here, net zero there. Net zero here, net zero there requires a lot of investment. What about the business that is needed to sustain that investment? What is your return on investment? That's what members of the board should think. About. It's not like, oh, this project very good. Okay, go, we go for it. What is the impact on the books? How are you planning to sustain it? Can you get uh, financing for it? Can you get insurance for it? Because to succeed, the project has to get financing and it has to get insurance as well, right? Unless the company is so cash rich that you can pay for it yourself. Ah, the <coughs> but even then, you use bank money, correct? So that's what it actually means. And the question that I have to ask the board is, Members of the board here is, how ready are you for this greater debt? I won't say even high, I, mean, I wouldn't say even, uh, um, how would you say, uh, uh, granular reporting. This is just ballpark figures or group figures that they've lumped together. And if you actually look at it, the Reliance Report 2021-22, it's actually all high level group data, which means underneath it, there's a lot of hidden already. But Members of the board, the members of boards here, I can tell you, Malaysian companies, not many ready to report. Which is why a lot of companies do ask me, oh, should I go to integrated reporting? Integrated reporting is reporting the past, present, and the future. We should talk about input and talk about output. Until we mem board members change the mindset that we have to start disclosing a bit more in terms of transparency, it will be very hard for us to fully embrace the requirement of integrated reporting. To do this for a Malaysian company now is a journey of three to four years. You know something you can flip overnight and say do. Because most board members still don't understand. But it is important for you to understand because of this. Because of this, because of TCFD, TCFD have now been absorbed into IFRS, GRI have now been absorbed into IFRS, SASB, the International American Standards have been absorbed into IFRS, integrated reporting is now absorbed into IFRS. This is the mother of all reporting guidance now. And this reporting guidance basically says, by 2024, 2024 globally, those jurisdictions that are ready will already start reporting. Malaysia, we haven't arrived at a point yet. Uh, we will probably arrive at a point which could probably be Bursa 2025. Because Bursa 
reporting guidance requirements for the for public listed companies is 2025 to start reporting on TCFD, right? With full compliance by 2027, correct? We could be along those lines. And if we are along those lines, the question members of the board have to ask, how ready are we for financial impact reporting along the principle of double materiality? is the European legislation that I've been telling you about CS Triple D and all these regulations that are coming out of Europe is all governed under the DFRAC. They are releasing pieces and pieces of uh, legislation guidance directives slightly ahead of the IFRS but they are all built around TCFD and they are all aligned together with the IFRS. So you export to Europe or your intermediate product gets assembled somewhere and gets exported to Europe, you will be impacted by EFRAC as well. And EFRAC, under the, the reporting requirements of CSRD, uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive also talk about double materiality. The only one that doesn't talk about double materiality at this present moment is IFRS Standard 1 which is, oh, it sounds like standard one. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. S1, which basically uh, is about uh, sustainability reporting for ESG, financial impact sustainability reporting for ESG methods. Which still uh, just talks about materiality and not so much about double materiality. But if you report and you're exporting to Europe, you're going to be impacted by TCFD. You're already complying with S2. Might as well do S1, or, I mean, might as well do double materiality all the way. Lah. Because it doesn't make sense for one reporting to do double materiality, the other one, oh, chok, 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 no need to do, I don't need to be so stringent. So it, it doesn't make sense to do that. Adopt one methodology throughout the process of your ESG management. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Wow. Yes. Sorry, the, uh, the top, yes. Yes. Okay. How about the, the new ISSB? Which IFRS is set up the International Sustainability Standards Board, which incorporates GRI, TC, uh, sorry, um, TCFD, IFR, uh, 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 IAR Foundation, the Integrated Reporting, SASB, and, and, all, and CD, CSDB, CDSB. Uh, carbon something lah. <laughs> CDSB, CSD. So many acronyms, sorry, I also cannot keep. Yeah. Right? Many, many organizations in, and two, that was done two years ago. Two years down the line now, they've all been absorbed. Are there any uh, actually, this one has gone into here, this one has gone into here, this one is aligned to this one. No, there's no problem. At the end of the day, what we are looking at, members of uh, boards is by 2027 moving forward after 2027 you are probably looking at a new IFRS standard called IFRS S1 or S2 and a new IFRS standard means in terms of your accounting statements you need to start reporting on ESG cost impact and the impact on balance sheet think for those of you who are financial background and look at accounts and all of that, are you ready? So actually, my question is this, if we do the integrated reporting plan, it's encompassing everything. Right? And then by 2027, it will incorporate the new IFRS. You need to incorporate the financial reporting yes. requirement. No, the deadline came and went. It was 2017. Ask <laughs> the SC, SC members sitting here, right? MCCG says 2017, right? Best practice. No, must comply by 2017 if you have a uh, 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 capital revenue or total revenue of 2 billion, right? As as large company came, when now suddenly become best practice. But we still haven't moved on in the way that we review. We review 
uh, integrated report and the way we view sustainability reporting, we still haven't moved on. We're still thinking that ah, uh, tak apa, besar reporting requirement, compliance saja. When bursa, just to, to let you know, some those of you who attend, I tell a very consistent story for those of you who listen to me, right? When bursa came up with the sustainability guidance requirements in twenty one, oh sorry, in September last year, we ran a workshop, we ran a webinar, and in that we invited uh, Ace Market people, we invited the Big Cat as well. For the first time in my how many years of doing board training and board engagement webinars, and I've been doing this. Okay, but all of it. I'm so sorry, my head. Right, first time we had board members or senior senior management asking me, "What is the consequences of not complying with Bursa reporting requirements?" <laughs> For the first time, I was shocked. I mean, to say the least. But it also shows that our attitudes towards reporting, we haven't progressed. But the problem for board member is, you have a board for usually duty number one. Number two, the younger generation will not hesitate to take anybody to court now if they feel they have a case, right? Number three, none of us can afford reputation damage. Simple as that. So, as members of the board, the right questions have to be asked. The right question has to be asked of risk. The right question has to be asked of C-suite. The right question has to be asked also from your customer. What do you actually want? Because at the end of the day, like I said, this is not a battle of. What, what did somebody say the other day on Twitter? People planet and whatever about saving the planet. No, this is matter of making sure you still have a business, but doing business the right way, correct? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's matter of economy, stability, growth, correct? The mid cap and a smaller cap and ace market, sorry lah. The attitude is still. I mean, we are what a year plus out of COVID, two years, nearly two years, and they still say I'm doing COVID recovery. Don't pressure me with this. Don't pressure me. For certain sectors, I accept. Not all sectors, and certainly for what I call grown up SMEs, when the market cap is so big that technically they are even bigger than a lot of the big uh, PLCs, you still cannot have that. Mentality, right? And we have quite a few of that who are quite happy languishing at the bottom of the FBM KLC, right? In terms of um, performance and all, we can't have that, right? We the at the the understanding has to come all the way up from this market all the way up. But my biggest worry is actually not the not the public listed companies because we have Bursa to take care of it, we have SSE to take care of it. My biggest worry is the nine hundred thousand SMEs, who is the pillar, who are the pillar of our economy, who we all do business with, one way or the other. If we as PLCs and members of board sit down and don't ask these questions, how are we going to drive SMEs to improve and to meet this requirement? SMEs supply basically nearly everything from our car manufacturing up to whatever fancy electronic stuff we have, right? Who has oversight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scope three under multinational will force the 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 right. There is no choice. Right? We we were talking to somebody. I can't remember. I talked to so many people. But what I heard was that there was engagements done with PM, uh, SMEs. I think one one of my other KPMG partners who was running this forum, and the SMEs that we were engaging with, the feedback was. They know nothing of scope one, scope two, scope three. They know nothing of bank negara requirements. 
they know nothing of why they need to do this. Which is very sad. Yes. Yes. Hi, Hi. Uh, just going back to the definition of uh, the outside in uh, about double materiality, how sustainability issues affect company financial performance and value? How do you define value? Has it to do with the GRI definition of value? Okay, the GRI give you a guideline with regards to what they see as value. But at the end of the day, I take a broader view, right? Uh, value should be Yes, what the guidelines say, but it also should encompass what is value to you as an organization. So that goes back to the threshold of materiality. Correct. It's up to you as an organization to set up. No company and no organization that can come in and say, your threshold of materiality should be this. There is no such thing as should be. It is what is adjusted for your company. But as members of the board, some company will tend to put it more easily achievable la. and in that your risk will be your threshold will, will, will lower, right? You don't have so many high risk every climate risk certainly will be down there. Right? We have done where stakeholders came back and say climate risk is up there. Your customers say climate risk is up there. By the time the board look at it, senior management look at it, suddenly climate risk is down there. That happens and we see that quite a lot. Members of the board, you have a responsibility. If your customer is saying climate risk is very important to them, suddenly you are just until climate risk is not so important to you, why are you telling your customer? Did I say, why are you telling your customer? Because at the end of the day, materiality assessment goes to sustainability reporting done. It goes into a public document, right? But a lot of members of board don't seem to understand that, don't not understand, don't see the connection and simply because the time frames is so long, you get one report one month, you get another report one month. It's, unless you are, you know, very familiar with the subject, it's impossible to keep it in track. Right? So that's why maybe the best practice and we work with some some uh, Malaysian companies where they take a very uh, integrated view. So they form a committee, they inform the board, this is what's gonna happen, they inform the, the uh, senior management this is what's going to happen. This is what the steps are going to be. This is how I'm going to integrate. This is what I want to do in terms of reporting. And they stick to it. So maybe that, as members of the board, you might want to ask for that sort of program. So that you are aware. Number two, maybe members of the main board, all, and all of you members of the main board, some of you as chairman, could appoint somebody to look at it in terms of the board. And in essence, that's what the regulation said as well under uh, board fiduciary duty, right? Practice area 14. 14. 14. Yeah. Yes. Uh, maturity metrics, uh, I noticed is a tool, yes, used by many. Uh, started by Busan, is toolkit version 2. Uh, but then GRI mm -hmm. is kind of the emphasize using maturity uh, metrics as a tool. Because what do you do with it all? No? Uh, but uh, GRI is de emphasizing, but Busan is still using it. Is there any other tool for material assessment? Um, you can do work with uh, the newest, latest tool to play with now, with uh, sticks with some risk and some risk department and companies are not. Dynamic risk assessment. Too changi. Because there's too much interconnectivity of risk. It's too changi, right? So sorry to say we are still stuck with um, enterprise risk assessment and materiality assessment. You see what happens with is that once you do your maturity assessment, you identify what your risk, you prioritize, then you get your maturity matrix, right? Most companies stop there and say, this is my material risk and therefore I shall manage this risk. But you forget your material risk is actually part of your enterprise risk. It should be absorbed into your enterprise risk assessment process, right? Oh, sorry, I was going to make you work. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think. Yeah. You know, capital markets in Malaysia have got a very simple ESG disclosure guide coming up for SMEs. You know. So I'm surprised to see that SMEs are not fully really aware. There is a nationwide uh, SME corp. travel corp. They go around. Yes, I know. Uh, yes, so it can't be that bad. Yes, unless unless yes, they are not uh, exporting to multinationals. 
But we expose to multinationals. The multinationals will force you to, to address it. Now look, the problem is there are 900,000. We are probably reaching 10% yeah. or 20%. We still 80% that don't know anything. Our micro SMEs is even worse. Yeah. But they may not be so urgent as the one that supports the international company. It's not the support of international company. The banks are sending out questions and asking why you look at this. Yeah, and the Practical problem is, thing. what will happen is, we also got some SME funds, which are not small. That says, or bank says, I don't want to finance. No. Yeah. But oh, oh, there's just no decision. We have the right to make. No, but the gap is that, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people out there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Correct. It has yeah. to be yeah. brought down. You want to be a correct. How does it apply for no, this? Correct. That's why capital markets is done now. Simple ESG. Yeah. Capital market is an ESG. Right? So so that, that that is okay. SME Corp has actually partnered with uh, the uh, UN Global yeah, Complex. Yeah. UN Global Complex They actually formed an EFG program. But the I think it's only open to twenty companies at one go. Right? So it, it's also limited for our 900,000 uh, BLT, right? And once you, once you come up in your matrix, and once you understand this, most SMEs, for, the, for, for your information, have no risk department. The boss still do everything. So what, how can we help them? How can you help your supply chain? That's the question. These are companies that are part of your supply chain, big or small. The big suppliers, companies like oil and gas and all, have it well sorted because they have what we call, as also in the right, previously, they have what we call knowledge center mentor mentee programs for suppliers. Most of us have not even begun thinking about that. Procurement, three quarters of the time when we talk to procurement, the question is, Apart from due diligence, I don't know what else to do. Cannot lie, you cannot audit them to hell. If you audit, sorry. If you audit your supply chain too much, then you come to a stage where who's going to work for you? Who's going to supply to you? Cannot. Right? So you, it has to be a carrot and stick perspective. What you do to educate them, what you do in terms of fine. That's it. That's the only way to make it work. Because once you get this maturity matrix that you identify, you do have to be able to include it into your enterprise risk assessment process at some point in time. That's where you define your risk appetite, that's where you define your risk parameters and what you want to do with it. That's where it goes. It doesn't stop there as a maturity matrix. If it stops there as a maturity matrix, I can guarantee you 70% of the time the company comes up with a sustainability report, I will read and I think this company is piece of credit. Right hand talk, left hand don't know what I talk. And therefore, if you want to ask me what the position is with regards to financial impact reporting in Malaysia, I tell you, members of the board, members of board, if you do not ask your finance department, your risk department, your sustainability department to sit down and work it out, you will never be able to get the information. Think about it, right? Three quarters of your companies will come to you and say, and say, uh, three quarters of the company will come to you and say, I have transition plan. My energy transition plan is, number one, I want to put in solar panel. Number two, it will reduce my carbon emission by 30%. Number two, I want to change to green building. I want to build green building and move everybody there. So I need members of the board uh, to approve because in the, within the next five years, if I do these two things, I can reduce my carbon emission by 40%. Correct or not? This what you're hearing? This what you're hearing? Where's the money coming to financing? What is the return on investment? Where's the impact on your business? Are you asking your C3 your, your C these questions? How are you going to finance it? They go, oh, never mind. I 
speak to bank. This bank already said going to give me money, give me that money. Sustainability thing. No. What are the KPIs that are attached to it? Do the KPIs meeting of the KPIs need additional financing? Don't know. Because nobody has had a look at this key performance indicators, financing requirements. Or rather, God is part and parcel of operations, but it's hidden so much in the financial reporting that you actually have no key insight for the financial number. You roughly know every every year I spend maybe one million dollars on wastewater treatment plant. Is that money spent on wastewater treatment plant effective or not? Don't know. How many fines have you got? Don't know because it's all kept at site level. Correct? You don't see this information, do you, members of the board? Do you? You see very nice tidy financial figures. Correct? <laughs> what is down there? You don't know. What is the exposures? You don't know. How much money actually each site spent on flood mitigation? You don't know. Because the sites do not tell you how many times they get flooded. They do not tell you how many times they spend on sand back. They have to clean the site. How many times they went to bank to ask for money because it's within a certain amount of the whole budget to replace equipment. They don't tell you, do they? Because each site, as in operation site, is allowed a certain amount of autonomy. How is finance tracking all of this? How do you know where your exposures are? Okay, you talk about service, never mind. Service, small, small site, never mind. You multiply that by 300 times around Malaysia. Will that be a financial impact? Be very generous. One third, 100%, 100 companies of your site get impacted by climate change. Will you have a financial impact? Do you know what the quantum of financial impact going to be? Talk manufacturing, you have three sites. One in Klang, one in Johor, one in Penang. New industrial site ma, cheap ma, correct? Are they all going to be impacted by climate change? Don't know. Are they already impacted by climate change? Maybe, don't know. All of this then needs to be in, reported in. Your risk assessment process. This is how climate change or ESG impact business. Sorry, turn it into a lecture. <laughs> I am so sorry. And so we have to start looking and start asking for financial numbers. Because if we don't ask for these financial numbers, we don't know. We have too many don't knows. And when we work with clients and we tell them you have to know financial materiality, we work very hard to get. Very hard to find the Right? And the thing is for members of the board, it's very good that your company uh, subscribe to Net Zero, subscribe to Carbon Neutrality, either one. But you have to understand again, apart from the ESG commitments that you have and the money that you need to spend on Net Zero, both of them have a drain. Let's say, for example, you have a lot of waste and you commit to waste recycling. So your waste that you have is being thrown away from the municipality. Nobody tells you how much they spend or how many truck loads that they take. Correct? For construction waste, it's all packaged under the construction contract. You also don't know. What the contractor do with the waste also you don't know. Is there a potential financial fine there? As members of the board, should you be aware? Yes or no? Because under DOE, the fine immediately is half a million dollars and under the, uh, DOE legislation, you are guilty until you prove yourself innocent. So CEO face will come out in newspaper, site manager's face will come out in newspaper, contractor's face will not come out in newspaper. Correct? So, how? Companies suffer. Contractor get away from you. You know what I mean? And then if you say in your sustainability report, 
Okay, let's say you've been tracking, you've been very good. I spent $1 million in waste disposal, hazardous and non-hazardous waste. But I recycle my hazardous waste. I got DOE license and can recycle my hazardous waste. And I recycle my hazardous waste from 70% to 30%. Blah, 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 blah. What is the value that you save for the company? Waste report, recycling report quite often, right? Quite common, right? Correct? Do you report value you save the company? I recycle, I sell. Do you report how much you actually save the company, how much you generate revenue for the company? Or like some companies now very chunky. I do circular economy, right? I have no way. How much did it cost you to get into circular economy? Was it a return on investment worthwhile in terms of uh, circular economy or waste disposal? Anybody report that? No, no, no. You are spending money. The question is, is the money well spent? Okay, any more questions? Actually, the concept of double materiality very simple. Alright? So, materiality is financial materiality. Any questions?
mind-boggling the amount of work that needs to be done. So the question then is, four boards and all, can we draw a cut-off line and say we start which project, which project, which project? At the present moment, I have no answer for you. We are still waiting for ISSB, IFRS to come up with that. But if it becomes a financial accounting standard, which we expect it to be in the next maybe five years and beyond, but then again, every time I say five years and beyond, IFRS has to be me and maybe faster. It could be more pressure. You look at DCFD reporting. If I were IFRS and I look the world, DCFD reporting has been around since 2015. Would I want to give you a case? It's been around uh, some time already. Right? You should be used to it. Correct? Maybe in Asia we get a chance, uh, but the rest of the world uh, for, for Europe and US, I don't think so. But if Europe and US start reporting now, the pressure will be on us as the supply chain. So either way we are hit, either way we have to prepare, either way we have to start knowing where this financial information is. Alright? We need to know what the premise is, where the numbers is, and how for you and board, you might not report this in your in your sustainability reporting, TCFT reporting or whatever, other reporting that is coming out and integrated annual report. But for you as board, you need to know what the impact on your bottom line is going to be. What is your P and L going to be? How are you planning to finance? Hello, climate change is more than, it's one big project that's going to suck all your resources, but you still got other resources that need to go, I mean, other projects that need to go, correct? It cannot suck all your resources, correct? So that's why the question of abatement curves, decision making process on the best, cost of action and best investment needs to come in. But you need to know. So you cannot buta buta just let the, your operations people tell you that it's, this is it, or consultants tell you. You have to be able to understand to ask the question. Right? And we hear all sorts of stories as well. So maybe at tea time after this. Next. Thank you. Okay. Alright. So in, in general, like I said, because of the difficulty in reporting uh, financial information and how Europe since they were the first one to actually start requiring this, you will find European companies start reporting on their CapEx. A report on CapEx, no point. It's your OpEx that actually has an annual impact, right? CapEx is one off, correct? CapEx, you put budget there already, habis. But OpEx happens every year, every year, every year, and sometimes go up, never come down, or always go up or not, right? How are you going to impact with regards to PL? How much money do you have to make to cover your operating expenses? That's the question. How much money do you have to make to cover your operating expenses and to cover your climate reduction technologies? Pengarang, you hear I hear lah, Pengarang is going into uh, hydrogen. Partnership, high capital investment. Find money where? Partner where? If you are partnering with them, you need to know where, right? You need to know budget, right? You need to know where, where, what the sustainability of the project is, correct? Right now. TNB says as part of the net zero plan is to get, uh, invest in uh, solar panel and hydro carbon uh, hydropower overseas and then channel back in Malaysia. How, where, when is that going to work? What's the impact? And how will that impact your own carbon reduction plan? We don't have enough details at the present moment in Malaysia. Alright, so let's do some work. Any questions? Rules and responsibilities, very important. Right? At most, uh, bots will have this sort of structure. You should have your own TOR written out. So let's do some exercise. Let's talk about ABC company. So these are your sustainability matters. So if you have a company which is uh, a conglomerate, which owns a diverse range of business, and they are in telco, property development, manufacturing, power generation, construction, and all, materiality-wise, 
Just take it as what is listed here lah. Ah, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. Revenue generation. Right? Understand? The company main business is in telco, property development, manufacturing, power generation, and construction. Don't ask why so strange. We have seen stranger mix in our real life conglomerates, right? So let's say that this is the company. What do you think are its sustainability matters? Let's rate them. Let's get from Tunku your table. Give me five. Land bank management. No, it's telco, uh, property. Uh, it's a mix. Uh, it's a big mix. Uh. <laughs> my pointer landed there. <laughs> hey, you guys can help. Uh. Waste management. Ah, oh, okay. Waste management. Sure. Yeah, labor as well. Human rights. Human rights. Okay. Okay, thanks. Dato, Raymond, your table? Water shortage. Sorry, ah, where in mind is self property, manufacturing, power generation, construction, ah? Water, solid, pollution. Asset management. Asset management. Energy efficiency. Hmm. And why do I bring this in? As members of board, you now increasingly when we do materiality assessment you should be involved in choosing material methods okay so Raymond The need to contribute. Yes, Miss Jean. Data privacy. Data privacy, PDPA legislation requirement. Yeah. Compliant, very compliant. Yes. Anybody else? Site operations. Sorry. Site operations. Site operations. Yes. Correct. Correct. But but the problem is, if you are a board of a conglomerate, Malaysia got plenty, right? How do you prioritize? Do you have to do materiality assessment before you do your materiality assessment? Yes. That's the only way that you can do it, right? But if let's say, for example, your business is mainly in uh, power generation, right? 70% of your business is in power generation. But you could have a business here that costs more impact. So how do you define materiality? The materiality within materiality. What are your boundaries? Impact proportion to, to the business. Right? So you got two quandaries here. If the sustainability team comes to you and say, I've done my impact assessment. And because we are conglomerate, I only focus on material, financial materiality, which is basically the one that brings in the bis biggest business. Now. Uh, for most business, it makes sense uh, because the big boy there will tell you everybody else, shut up. My impact is most important. You must ensure my sustainability before we talk about that because I'm financing all of you. Sorry. Sounds very arrogant, but that's the way they do. That's the way it happens, right? So if you take that view, if you take that point of view, there's no wrong. But should you should ask the question, what is the impact also of the other business? Should you take a financial perspective on materiality or should you take an impact assessment on materiality? Because how then the choice of material methods will be very different. Sorry? Both then complicates a bit matter. Not many people very experienced in doing that. Correct. Correct? Correct. So, but you as board must ask. Right? 
and and sometimes they will tell you oh i need to go consultant but actually think a little bit maybe you don't need to do consultant yeah. think a little bit what you can do That's you know what i mean <laughs> consultant is i mean i'm a consultant i've been a consultant for 30 plus years we are not the be all and end all nice listening to me but i not necessarily know everything correct Depends, depends, depends. And if you don't prioritize capital allocation, like I said, the banks are going to look at it. There's no point doing business if you can't get loan, right? So that's why it's actually very important. Why? Boards need to be involved. Senior management also need to be involved. That's step number one. Step number two is, for ABC Group, who are your stakeholders? Let's say, for example, you operate in Malaysia. Operate in Malaysia, very senang. But Malaysian companies now are international, you know. They operate in Myanmar. Don't ask me how they got there, but they're in Myanmar. They operate in Indonesia. They operate in Sudan. Don't ask me how they got there also, but they are there. You know what I mean? Right? So, how do you then look at your stakeholders? When you do your stakeholder engagement, do you keep it to Malaysia only? The 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 um the tendency is always to keep it in Malaysia only. Does that give you fair exposure, fair review of what your impacts are? If you have fifteen percent of your business in Myanmar, should you consider Myanmar? So that view also needs to be brought in in terms of materiality. If Let's say, for example, some of the agricultural manufacturers, the cocoa producers and all, they do have partnerships and all of that for suppliers in Africa. Should they be involved as well as stakeholders? These are questions that need to be asked. But most companies, when you talk to the sustainability department, they will tell you, oh, my stakeholder engagement only in Malaysia. Not enough. Right? Tunku, when you were with Nestle, they did global, right? Or they did regional, correct? Yes, right. You have to take that approach. We have to stop thinking Malaysia only. We, Malaysian company, are not Malaysia only. We, Malaysian companies, are now regional or international, something we have to be very proud of. But it means the way that we approach the management has to expand also, right? And when you talk about stakeholders, don't lobby. So narrow. I have got companies that say, oh, this year I do stakeholder engagement, I keep it to employees and management only can. Can. But what value is that to you? Right? Or the tendency is to keep it easy because the problem is a lot of old school and particularly the, the smaller uh, consulting and also the smaller companies don't understand the value of stakeholder engagement and materiality assessment now and how it actually can influence the whole way that you view your risk. They don't understand that. So they tend to do what is compliant with the requirements. Lah. Requirements say I do Malaysia, I do Malaysia. Lah. Compliance say I only need to think about customer, supplier, investor, bank and all. I only do that. I do want to trouble? Why do I want to invite trouble? Basically, the attitude is by talking to other invest, other stakeholders, right? So that that's the thing. The other thing that you also need to understand is when you do materiality assessment, it is always like strategy. You do for five year or you do for three year. IKEA works on five year materiality assessment planning, which they integrate into your strategy planning. So they, every five years, they'll report a new plan or how they want to move forward. So if a company tells you, oh sorry, yeah, a company tells you that, oh, every year I need to have budget to do materiality assessment every year, tapaya. Tapaya, as members of the board. Tiga tahun sekali boleh. Tapi, for the first three years of doing this, yes. Lepas tu, three years, five, three or five years. Sounds like a consultant, like, helping people from using my resource. Okay, right, anyway, fair value. And these are things that you guys should be aware of. Stra scenario analysis, maturity assessment, risk assessment, all part and parcel of going into where you want to plan your forward business and how you manage your, your, your inherent risk, right? So that, that's what needs to be done. So then the next thing is how you prioritize your risk. And that's the most important one. How do you prioritize your stakeholders? 
and how do you prioritize your material matters and then coupled with your external stakeholder engagement process you then come up with a sustainability matrix sorry i didn't show you how the sustainability matrix works lah. okay so that, then you integrate into your enterprise risk assessment and that's how you identify what uh, uh, financial matters you need to track that's how you identify and narrow down your key sustainability matters and that in a nutshell ladies and gentlemen is double materiality did i do it within the time frame yes right yeah. <laughs> okay any questions i have a question yes you know, it's quite interesting just now you said that you know you question what is the roi It's a bit oxymoron, isn't it? Because if you say that if it doesn't bring in ROI, it doesn't give us the value that we're looking at. Because it is a balancing act. Correct. Right? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, is a lot of companies that would then take the step that we wait until regulator tells us it's compulsory. Can I? But I do it. But you cannot. Yeah, because because going back to what you said, you know, it's huge investment. Correct. Why should I take that initiative to Correct. do that? But you cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, correct. But you see, return is not just on monetary. Return can also be amount of carbon saved. Return can also be amount of com uh, jobs that you create. However, we do not uh, the way that we take uh, calculate return on investment now is all on monetary terms. But if you look at companies like Nestle, the international ones, they calculate community impact, they calculate carbon reduction. Therefore, then you look at the total what we at we at KPMG call true value, economic, environmental, social gains. That's how you calculate your return on investment. But at the present moment, our mindset is always on PL, money, dollars and cents. But we have to look at impact at a greater view. So let's say, for example, CCUS, $1.6 billion investment. Okay? $1.6 dollar investment without a carbon tax is pure cost only. But you're taking out maybe 30% uh, of your total carbon emission. 30% of your total carbon emission. Let's say, for example, you are generating 100,000 tons. 30% is a significant amount. If you apply proxy Singapore uh, tax of 25 Sing dollar, and that's quite realistic uh, because the, the last carbon credit that was sold, the only carbon credit that was sold, was 80 ringgit, right? 76 ringgit, 80 ringgit. So it's very close to the Singapore already. So if our carbon tax, I'm not saying it will come in, uh, projected, let's say we, we use as a proxy, it's about 80 ringgit per ton of CO2, 30% of half of, of 100,000 tons is a significant amount of money to offset your return on investment for CCUS. That's how you need to think about impact now. In fact, I think uh, one of the things that board perhaps needs to do, you know, when we evaluate projects and a lot of companies have started to do this, is to actually put in that carbon pricing in there for all your products. Or internal carbon pricing. Yes, for internal carbon pricing. And so there's something that we can drive as well. Yes. So what is the cost and benefit? And the other thing which a lot of Malaysia uh, companies, actually not Malaysian companies, what is it? but a lot of companies actually regionally and globally don't look at this. Apart from the environmental benefit that you get from carbon, right? And the benefit that you get for biodiversity. Biodiversity, let's not talk yet. The, the jury is still out on methodology. So let's leave that aside. We have to wait. That one we really have to wait. But there are already tools such as return, social return on investment. There's already tools measuring efficiency and effectiveness of, of, of workforce and all. But we are not, we are not, how do you say, uh, utilizing all of this. And we are not, definitely not including it into our, our cost benefit analysis. So we are not helping ourselves with our conservativeness in reporting by painting the true picture of actually how much we as an organization or company are doing with regards to ESG, climate change, and business-wise. We're too conservative, basically. Okay, back to you, Jennifer. Hey, uh, let's give a big round of applause to you. Okay. Um, so, really appreciate uh, Oi Cheng's candor. I think she was very direct with us on quite a few areas. So just all right. Um, so um, let me just. Uh, 
So thank you uh, again for all your questions and participation. You know, so a couple of takeaways from me. You know, one is that I think as board members, you know, we um, obviously have the opportunity to make a big, big impact by asking the right question. Right. So obviously, it's a broader issue beyond just the financial PNL. You know, as board members now, we really need to think across a whole spectrum of risk. And what Oi Cheng is also trying to say to us, I think, is we need to stop looking at the sustainability strategy and the business strategy. You know, it has got to be one integrated business strategy. Yeah. So I think as board members, there's a big impact that we can make to, to demand that this is an integrated point of view rather than to look at sustainability, climate, ESG in a, diff, in a, in a separate bucket. Yeah. Um, I also heard that we've got to change our mindset, as in we can no longer just look after our own backyard. You know, we have to bring along our suppliers, bring along our SMEs together with us. So um, I think if you look at all your notes, I think all of us have a long list of takeaways. You'll get the slides, um, so you have an opportunity to look through. I think she has, to be honest, Oi Cheng has probably covered only about 30% <laughs> of the content, you know, so there's a lot of gems in her materials, so I really encourage you to go back and look at it. She's also provided us with um, a guidance of how do we uh, um, do the risk assessment, double materiality um, in a very structured way. All right. So uh, thank you again. And um, moving forward, I want to um, cover again the, the point about the Climate Chair Masterclass Series is is a series of seven sessions altogether. Now we have done two. We have another five more to go, year to go, right? So all of the sessions are um, going to be run by really excellent speakers. So the next, uh, and I'll introduce the two coming up. So we got, um, this is on the 2nd of October. So we got Philip Jobet. You know, some of you may have heard him before. He's, he's been to Malaysia quite a few times. You know, he's the CEO of, of Earth on board um, and he is going to be leading a class on the new era of board duties right so um, and that session is hosted by video forum then the next one after that two weeks after that in the middle of october 13th of october we have helen crowley um, she's a partner at pollination and she's going to talk to us about biodiversity and tn tnfd and i think uh Oichin also touched a tiny bit on that <laughs> Early on, so she's going to deep dive on um, TNFD. Um, so, and the other one that we want to bring to your attention again, uh, Latin Sunita spoke a bit about this earlier on. We have a big, big event coming up. Uh, this is in September, in early September. Uh, the National Climate Governance Summit is a three day event, it's hybrid. If you can't be there physically, you can, you don't have any excuse, you can still participate online all right so fantastic speakers i heard we've got 70 over speakers i think 80 80 speakers you know so there's workshops there are panels and plenaries and and, and so on so uh, go to our website so you can see um, you can understand more about what's happening there um, and then you know i think we always have we always have this slide in all our events you know we urge you to be our corporate friends, you know. So we are non-profit, you know. Um, there's a lot of volunteers, there's a lot of people who, and, and also a lot of companies, and also uh, organizations such as uh, this is the Security Commission, Bursa, we they all support us. You know, in the end, what will make a difference is more corporate support as well. So if you are not already a corporate friend, we really encourage you to, to sign up. And, and as individuals, if you uh, if you are in a position to give your time, really encourage you to talk to any of us. Yeah. Um, we really want your feedback. So if I can just uh, ask for two minutes of your time to just scan that on your phone and give us your feedback. I promise you, there's only last something like five questions. It's uh, it's very quick. We want your feedback because we've got five more sessions to go. So we want to keep uh, tweaking so that we can bring, um, bring more value to the next few sessions. 